Buenos dias, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be in Argentina, my first time here, a beautiful country. So I have uh, much to be thankful for to Argentina last year. I am a big soccer fan. Manchester City is my team. So Sergio Conaguero is my hero. Last kick of the last game, 93rd minute. Win the Premier League. All right. So bravo, Sergio. OK, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, ion torrent semiconductor sequencing and also give you uh, an introduction to the ion proton sequencer, which is our newest platform uh, uh, that we have just launched. So this is general outline. I'll talk to you about how the general principles of ion torrent sequencing, if you're not familiar with them, the general way you construct a library for next generation sequencing, uh, prepare the template, and then we'll do a little bit on the sequences themselves the software tools that you will uh, need to analyze the data. There is a lot of data produced in next generation sequencing. And uh, then an idea on the performance and some of the data that our uh, users of the system are presenting. And then a little in-depth, hopefully, if we have time, and I've got to keep track of the time, because Joe has to get a plane tonight, on Ion AmpleSeq, which is our technology for targeted gene resequencing. So we have a tagline that we say the chip is the machine. And that really is true for ion torrent chemistry more than for any other technology out there. The, the detection mechanism is completely inside the chip itself. So inside our machines, there are no cameras, no lasers, no optics, which makes them very simple. It also makes them very scalable, because we can just have different chips at different sizes. And that expands the scale of sequencing we can do. The chemistry itself doesn't require any fluorescence. So there are no fluorescent molecules, no chemiluminescent molecules needed. Uh, and it's incredibly fast, because we're using chip technology to actually do the detection of the incorporation of DNA molecules. So scalable, simple, and very fast. And also, not the least important, inexpensive. So we view the technology in the same way that the, the evolution of the computer industry happened. If you think back to the 1960s and 1970s, the computer was a very big piece of equipment that sat in a university or an institution and cost many millions of dollars. Uh, 20, 30 years ago in the 1980s, the microprocessor revolution happened. And we went from the mainframe through the mini computer and then into the era of the 1980s into the personal computer. And the result of that was the iPhone and the Blackberry that everybody carries in their pockets today and everybody has a PC on their desktop. We believe at Iron Torrent that is what we can do for sequencing. So our goal, our mission, is to take sequencing from the big genome laboratories, the big genome centers, and make that technology available to any scientist at any lab around the world. And the way we do that is to use this semiconductor technology. This, I'll tell you the underlying principles of the technology. So on the top left of the slide, and I'm sorry I can't point at every slide, you'll see a, a, a standard silicon wafer. And that wafer is the same uh, wafer that is used in the manufacture of uh, the iPhone cameras. That's a, what's called a CMOS uh, wafer. Uh, and the only difference between our chips and the chips that are in your iPhone camera or your BlackBerry camera is the iPhone camera sees photons, whereas our chips see protons. So they actually sense the output of a proton, a hydrogen ion, uh, and that, in effect, is a pH measurement. So you can think of this as a very sophisticated solid-state semiconductor-based pH meter. We take that chip technology, and on the right, we package it. And you can see uh, the two round circles are the fluidic inlet, and we're flowing uh, liquids across the surface of the chip. The oval-shaped area in the center is actually the, uh, the surface of the chip itself. 
and that's where the, the liquid is going across the surface. And if you zoom in and look at that surface, what you see is the, the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, on that surface are millions of small wells that are about three microns in diameter. <laughs> Underneath that, you can see a green layer, and that is actually the pH sensing layer. So it's a layer in the chip itself that senses the, the output of hydrogen ions. Underneath each well is a transistor, and so we register that change uh, at, via the transistor. On the bottom left corner, you'll see how we do that. What we do, that's a cross-section of one well on a chip. Into that well, we place a small particle, we call it an ion sphere, and on that particle, we have clonally amplified small fragments of DNA. And one bead has only one copy of that well after we finish the process. Uh, so we flow in one nucleotide at a time, a natural unmodified nucleotide. There's a polymerase attached to the strand, the fragment on the bead. That polymerase will incorporate that de the first nucleotide if it is a match. That then nucleotide releases a hydrogen ion. The pH in the well drops and we register a base. So that's the way we call bases with the ion torrent system. And we register that change as a voltage, and then we transform that voltage into the base coil itself. And obviously we're doing that many millions of times, and it depends on how many, the size of the chip, how many millions of reactions. So we flow an A, a T, a C, then a G, all consecutively. Okay, so we launched the technology at the end of 2010, the beginning of 2011, and we had one chip in the beginning, the ION314 chip. That chip has one million wells on its surface, and the original specification for that chip was it would give us 10 megabases of DNA sequence, so 10 million base output of DNA sequence. And that original chip had a read length. We had the fragments that we amplified onto the particle itself were around 100 bases in. in. Uh, that's the problem. <laughs> we're around 100 bases in length. Uh, in the middle of 2011, we introduced a, a second chip called the ION316 that had 6 million wells on its surface and an output of 100 megabases, min, uh, a minimum output of 100 megabases. And then around about the end of last year, the beginning of this year, we released a third chip uh, called the ION318 chip, and that has 11 million wells on its surface. <coughs> We've been steadily increasing the output of each chip, and the way we increase the output of each chip is in a, uh, there are really a few different axes that we, uh, that we progress the output on. First of all, the read length. You can see the arrow up and to the right is pointing at more output per chip. And uh, as you increase the read length, you get automatically get more output. We can also increase the number of wells on the chip. That's how we get more output. And thirdly, we can increase the loading of those particles. So the more particles we get uh, with live beads on them, the, the more sequence we get out of it. So today, if uh, we keep a running total, we have a little scoreboard inside Iron Torrent uh, that the R&D team looks at to see what are our best runs that we've ever done internally. And we look at this every week. I actually looked at it this morning. So July's R&D performance, and this is the best ever run that we have seen inside Iron Torrent. The tiny little Ion 314 chip that originally was spec to give us 10 megabases, we have a run internally in our R&D team that gave us 237 megabases. So over 20 times its initial specification at launch. Now, that's not to say that everybody can get that output. Typically, you would, uh, most labs will see 30, 40 megabases. And my colleague, Dr. Borland, will show you, in reality, what he gets in his lab later. Our big chips now, our ION318 chip, we're up to over one and a half gigabases. So the chip uh, has potential to go much higher than the original specification. In January, we also announced 
the launch of uh, later this year of two new chips and a new platform. So we've scaled the technology by tenfold every time we've introduced a new chip generation. And with the Ion Proton chips and the Proton 1 and Proton 2 devices, we'll now be uh, scaling to the first chip to give us 10 gigabases of output and the second, chase, second chip to give us uh, probably in the region of 60 or so to 80 gigabases of output. So now those chip devices are in the, the scale to sequence human exomes and human genomes, all with the same runtime that the technology of the PGM. So we can do that sequencing in just a couple of hours. So the chemistry, as I said, is very simple. Uh, and the beauty of the technology really is in this picture. Um, when we flow the nucleotides in along the top, uh, the polymerase grabs the correct nucleotide from the strand and incorporates that DNA nucleotide. And then you get that release of hydrogen ions that gives the signal. So really, it was the, the brilliance of realizing that you could look across the other side of that molecule, not at the pyrophosphates being released. But you could look at the hydrogen ion and do that detection that it really is the basis of the chemistry. The workflow is uh, very simple. We have really four steps in the workflow. You have uh, a library construction process where you take your DNA and you either amplify the regions of interest or you fragment the genome to the, the size of the nucleotide, the size of the DNA strands that you need. And that can be as little as two hours, depends on exactly which process they use for the library construction. And then you go through a template preparation phase, and we have an instrument that automates that process. That's about four to five hours. And then the sequencing itself uh, depends on which chip exactly you use. But if we take the IN314 chip, run uh, about uh, 100 bases of sequence, that would be one and a half hours for that run. The analysis of that data from that output on the IN314 would be about 30 minutes. Even on the biggest chip on the PGM, the analysis time is only about four hours. So this is something that you could do in uh, a day. It might be a pretty long day. You can certainly do it in a day and a half uh, for the whole process from start to finish. So we've had a, a great year since we launched. Um, we now have over 1,000 PGMs worldwide shipped and uh, close to nearly 1,000 installed now. We have a, a community of members who uh, are interested or work on the ION technology. That's called the ION community. And we now have over 10,000 members of that community that you can communicate with and uh, about protocols, about products. And we've been steadily increasing the performance of the system, and by the end of this year, we'll be at read lengths of 400 bases with Q30 quality. So really, the technology has transformed from its earliest generation in early 2011 to where we will be at the end of this year. So let's have a look at the, quickly at the library construction process and the library uh, creation process for Ion Tyrant. The process depends on exactly what application you want to do. Uh, in this particular slide, what I'm showing is the uh, library construction. For example, if you wanted to sequence a microbial genome or a viral genome on the PGM platform, or for example, a, on a human genome on the Proton platform, you take your isolated DNA, you fragment it. Uh, there are a number of ways to fragment the DNA, uh, physical shearing or enzymatic that we have kits for. Or if you're targeting genes, uh, we have a multiplex PCR method called ion AmpliSeq that I'll talk about later. Uh, or there are capture-based methods for hybridization where you can pull down specific regions of the genome that you're interested in. Uh, once you have your DNA of the right size, you ligate on adapter sequences. Uh, and that may or may not include a, a barcode that will allow you to do multiple samples inside the same chip and deconvolute the information at the end bioinformatically. Uh, once you have your adapters on, you then clonally amplify those fragments onto the little particles that end up inside the chip. And that's done with a, an instrument called the OneTouch. 
Uh, and then you take those particles, you put them inside the chip itself, and then you sequence them on the PGM on the proton. So we have a number of kits and a number of uh, products for different kinds of library preparation. Uh, I won't go into all of them. We have the Ion Express PROS Fragment Library Kit is an enzymatic fragmentation protocol. Uh, it takes about two hours. We have an instrument called the AB Library Builder that allows you to automate that whole library creation process and make 13 libraries at a time. So if you want to sequence multiple patient samples on one chip and uh, you don't want to create all those libraries individually, there's actually an instrument that can do that for you. Uh, we have library creation kits for RNA. If you're doing RNA sequencing, Tony earlier talked about hypothesis-free RNA discovery. You can do that on the PGM and on the Proton with the ion total RNA seq kit. We also have barcodes to allow you to sequence these multiple patient samples. We have 96 barcodes available that are specific to the ion torrent DNA protocols. And we also have 16 barcodes for RNA. And also instruments uh, for the sizing of the library, the correct sizing to make sure the fragments that are going into the clonal PCR are correct. I'm going to talk a more about this at the end of the talk if I have time, but we have uh, a new technology we introduced at the end of 2010 called Ion AmpliSeq, and this is really a, a breakthrough technology for targeted resequencing. With this technology, we can do uh, thousands of amplicons and multiplex PCR them together in the same reaction and then go into the, the preparation process for ion sequencing. We have three panels that we have designed for uh, that are available to buy off the shelf or ready to use. Uh, the small cancer panel looks at 46 genes, about 700 mutations. An inherited disease panel that surveys 300 genes that are involved in nearly every inherited disease that you could test for. And that runs on the 316 chip. And then a very big, what we call comprehensive cancer panel that actually surveys the full exons of over 400 genes to uh, about 350x coverage uh, called the comprehensive cancer panel. And that runs on the IN318 chip. In addition to those standard off-the-shelf panels, we have a custom process that uh, I think Anna mentioned in the beginning that should be coming soon, or Tony mentioned, coming soon to Argentina, where you can request a design for any genes or any region of the genome, human genome right now, uh, that you're interested in. And we can do up to 3,000 plex per reaction. That Sorry, going back a slide. This technology allows you to target regions up to about one megabase in size of the genome. If you really need to go much bigger than that, we have uh, also a technology based on hybridization called TargetSeq, and that can target regions from one megabase to 10 megabases in size. Uh, with that, it's a custom product again, uh, uh, great reproducibility, uh, simple analysis, and uh, some, some metrics are shown here uh, for a, uh, a particular panel. I believe this was a um, cancer panel, about two megabases in size. So we were sequencing to about 600x read depth with this particular panel. The next scale up from that even is to target the whole exome, all the exon coding regions of the genome. And we have a new version of our TargetSeq Exome kit coming out uh, with the launch of the Proton platform in uh, the end of Q3 called the Ion TargetSeq Exome V2. And that's a 50 megabase design. It targets 50 megabases of the genome, all the coding regions, or as many as we can get. It's about 40 megabases of exons plus uh, microRNAs plus uh, uh, cosmic variants, plus all the tRNA, long non-coding RNA, and snow RNAs. Uh, so that's going to be the product that if you're interested in exome sequencing for the Proton platform. So next, you've made your library. You've decided what region of the genome, or what area of the genome, or which particular genes you're interested in. 
and you've created that library, the next thing you then have to do is to amplify that material onto the particles to get it ready to go into the ion ship. And that's called what we call template preparation. And we use two small instruments called the ion one touch system. And these are very small. They're about this big in size. Uh, you can see about 36 centimeters and 28 centimeters. And uh, that completely automates this template preparation protocol. And I'll show you how it works. So inside the platform itself is a, a small plate. We uh, take the particles and we place them in a, a reactor with some oil. And this is an emulsion PCR-based process. And we arrange the concentration of the aqueous phase with the PCR components, the particles, and the DNA such that it generates an emulsion droplet with one particle and one strand, one molecule of DNA. So we create those emulsions. And then those emulsions are flowed into uh, the PCR plate. You can see in the middle. And that PCR plate is held at two different temperature zones. So as the, part, as the droplets move up and down in the plate, they are thermal cycled. So we get the uh, fully extended population of uh, particles at the end. Some don't amplify. Uh, and we have to separate the well-amplified particles from the not amplified particles. And the way we do that is on the second device called the OneTouch ES, or the enrichment system. So this uh, is a, uses a standard uh, streptavidin magnetic uh, biotin streptavidin separation method. It's a very simple piece of equipment. It takes about 30 minutes for that protocol to operate. So really, it's a very simple workflow. It takes about uh, four to five hours. And you put the sample at the beginning of the one touch. About four hours later, you get your amplified material out. About half an hour to 45 minutes for the enrichment step. And then you're ready to go into the chip. So at that point, you're in the sequencer. So the PGM, we, we talked a little bit about the beginning, uh, runs the three chips, the first three chips, the ion 314, the 316, the 318. Uh, it runs uh, very quickly. It's a very simple piece of equipment. Inside the platform is really only some electronics and a little bit of fluidic handling. Uh, so a very simple, robust platform and allows us to get very quick run times as low as one and a half hours. If you're doing an RNA sequencing, you typically only need 30 to 50 bases, and that can be as low as 30 minutes for that kind of sequencing. It comes with a server. And the server does the, the base calling and uh, alignment to a preliminary reference genome. It can also do the variant calling. So there's a piece of software that runs on the torrent server called Torrent Suite. That handles the base calling, the mapping and alignment, and the variant calling itself. And, uh, I'll go into more detail on the software uh, a little bit after we talk about the Proton, because the software is actually common to both the PGM and the Proton platform. So the Proton system is our latest generation device. And uh, it really enables us to get to this exome and genome scale of sequencing with the ION technology. And the, the difference between it and the PGM is really the internal electronics and computing power that are needed to process chips that have um, 165 million or 660 million wells on the surface of them. So it, it really is a, a much more uh, heavily compute intensive process when you're doing genome scale sequencing and uh, exome scale sequencing. So there is a lot of compute just inside the, the instrument itself. And then we can talk later, we'll talk a little bit later about the computer. The instrument will run two chips, and the instrument is already ready to run both chips. There is no upgrade or change to the hardware itself that will be required to run both Proton 1 and Proton 2. And what these chips will enable you to do is to get to um, human genome scale sequencing or exome scale sequencing. 10 gigabases on the Proton 1, and uh, up to a 20x to 30x human genome on the Proton 2 chip. 
Uh, the runs will take a couple of hours uh, for 100 bases, maybe three to four hours for a 200 base read. And uh, US pricing will be around $1,000 per run. You can run two exomes on the Proton 1 chip, uh, and the Proton 2 will run a single human genome or up to eight exomes per run. So this has been the goal of the community for a long time. How have you gone from the, the $3 billion human genome 10 years ago? We now have a platform today that will allow us to do a human genome in a few hours for just $1,000. How did we do that? The chips that we uh, used on the ION3, the ION3 series chips, the PGM chips, were made in uh, semiconductor factories that are the equivalent of your computers from 15 years ago. The new chips for the Proton platform we took, we go forward about 15 years in time and we realize all the value of that accumulated Moore's law and we can build a chip that has 165 million wells, that has the speed, the same speed as those original chips because chips not only get denser, they get faster as you get uh, more and more compute on them. And we can therefore build a chip uh, with the same technology that has a, a, another order of magnitude, higher density, but still gives you the same runtime. So I'll quickly show you some data. Uh, we got our first chips for the Proton platform in about November of last year. Uh, so we've been steadily working on the improvement. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, this is mappable reads, so how many reads are we seeing that are greater than 50 base pairs? So we started out in January, we were seeing about 15 million. As we've improved the loading, we've improved various pieces of the software, we're now seeing uh, close to a, a maximum of 100 million 50 base pair reads. So it's generally accepted that a, a transcriptome, a human transcriptome, would take you about 30 to 40 million reads. So this platform will definitely be applicable to Proton 1 chip for whole transcriptome sequencing. <coughs> On the right-hand side, you can see mappable throughput. That's uh, gigs. Uh, it's been steadily increasing gigabases of output. We're now seeing, uh, as of the end of last month, uh, eight gigabases. Our target is to get to up to 10 gigabases on the first chip when we launch. So we're already, we're very close to our, our launch specification uh, for this product. I'll quickly show you some of the most recent exome data. This is uh, the output from a single uh, whole human exome run using that V2 exome I showed you earlier. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read the numbers. Uh, the top number here is the total number of addressable wells, and that's 164,800,000. We actually got about 85% of them to give us uh, get a bead into that well. And of those beads, about 97% of them were actually what we call live. They had something that you could sequence on them. Uh, and so in terms of the output, we got about uh, 135 million library reads. Uh, and total base output was about 7 gigabases of mappable, of which 5.2 gigabases was completely uh, perfect error-free reads. Um, so in terms of mappable output, we had almost 100 million 50 base pair reads, uh, about just under 90 million greater than 100 base pair reads, uh, and then it was a pretty steep drop off to 150, we only get about 500,000. So this is the area we're improving as we go along, and we'll get more of the reads to go longer, uh, and we'll have more, more 150 base pair reads. In terms of the accuracy, uh, we're at 99% average raw read accuracy. That's average. There is a lot of reads that are above that accuracy, and there are reads that are below that accuracy. At 100 base pairs, we're at 99% accuracy. So the accuracy is good. The modal read length, uh, the most common read length, was about 125 base pairs right now. This is a, a plot of some exome data. This is the way that exome data is typically looked at uh, on the on the x-axis, we have the coverage, so how many times do you see an individual base? And on the y-axis, uh, the percent of the exome that you see at that coverage level. So the standard metric we usually look at is what is your coverage 
what percent of the axon do you see at 20x? So see an individual base, all those bases, 20 times, what percent of that axon? 80% uh, is a good number, and this one we're seeing 90% of bases at greater than 20x. So this is a really high quality uh, exome, we believe. Average depth was about 95x. And uh, there are some metrics on SNP call rates. We called about 29,000 SNPs. Uh, about 98% of them were concordant with DB SNP 135. Uh, if that number is 98 or 99%, that's very good. And again, all these three percentage numbers, the percentage of heterozygotes and the percentage of homozygotes should be in the 98 to 99, and they, they all are. Okay, I'll move quickly to talk about the, the software itself. Um, the torrent suite software comes pre-installed on the server. It, it runs... Um, uh, as an enterprise solution, it runs directly on that torrent server and it, supports, it will support both the Proton and the PGM platform. Um, the, the software itself does both, as I said, the uh, uh, alignment, the mapping, the base calling, and the variant calling. And this is all in the time that we, I specified earlier. So the flow basically is the instrument generates the raw data and uh, it's then processed. The voltage signals are processed to give you the base calls. And the, the torrent browser, uh, the torrent suite software, aligns to the reference genome that you give it. So if it's a human genome, you'll, you'll map against the human reference. If it's a microbial genome, you'll map against the microbial reference. And there's a way to install all those reference genomes in there. Uh, it processes the data, and you get out a standard set of files. Uh, the SFF file, that's the flowgram file. A FASTQ file. That's the industry standard format for next generation sequencing. Uh, or a BAM file. That's the aligned reads to the genome. So that's the primary analysis. So that's really the top track in blue. There are a set of uh, what we call plugins, which are little software programs that you can add to the capability of the torrent browser. And one of those is the variant calling plugin. And they come from both ION. And they also come from third-party software providers. And they can also come from the community itself. The software is completely open source. And we let people build little tools for the software. And these show up in a little store inside the Ion community called the Ion Plugin Store. And you can select them and download them. And they're all uh, uh, free. If you're already familiar with uh, other software tools for downstream analysis. Uh, the standard format files allow you to interface directly with uh, third-party tools like DNA Star or uh, Strand of Adis, Soft Genetics, CLC Bio, Partech. All those tools are directly uh, connectable to ion torrent data. So one of the things that we've had to tackle as uh, ION is how to make the analysis get faster. And obviously our chip output, and especially with the Proton 1 and Proton 2 chips, uh, has been getting, our output has been getting much, much faster. And we need to get the analysis time to be match the runtime of the sequencer. So the software team is doing a great job. Uh, if you look back to software version 1.5, which was uh, probably the uh, late last year, our ION 318 chip analysis time was probably around 14 hours. That's too long. We need it to match the output of the sequencer rate. And they've been working very hard on that. And today, it's about four hours. And we're projecting it will go down even further. Uh, so we're expecting that the Proton system will have a whole human genome analyzed in about 12 hours. So you can do the run in one day. And you'll be able to go from mapping, alignment, and variant calling on the human genome uh, within the same 24-hour period. So how do you deal with the massive amount of data that you're going to get from a Proton platform? The standard way today, if you buy a, a first generation or the older generation of platforms, is you have to buy the sequencing platform, and then you have to spend an awful lot of money on a very big compute infrastructure. The Ion Proton platform, 
actually the compute, the server that comes with the platform is a stand standalone tower. And uh, it will actually do all that processing and base calling and mapping and alignment directly inside that server itself. So there is no extra compute that you need. Uh, the simple tower device that comes along with a Proton is enough. If you want to go even further, uh, we have another piece of software called Ion Reporter, and that's a cloud-based solution. If you don't have the infrastructure or the compute capability to store all that data for the long term, uh, then we can port that data up into the cloud, the Amazon cloud, and then uh, store the data and do the analysis up there. And in addition to the mapping, the base calling, and the alignment, it will also do the annotation to find the biological meaning behind your variants and then report that as a reportable uh, output. Uh, I'll skip the specs. So the flow basically looks like this. So your instruments will generate the raw data. There's some processing. There's more processing happens on the Proton than happens on the PGM. <laughs> You'll be able to new the, review the initial run data, the mapping and alignment in the torrent suite. And then if you choose, you can optionally go to Iron Reporter. And that will allow you to layer in the annotation, find the biological meaning behind your data, and then make decisions on that. And then potentially put that into the electronic medical record of the patient. So Iron Reporter really takes us from uh, just the raw data to the meaning behind the data that you can use then with your clinical colleagues uh, to give them uh, usable information. We're good, we're good? All right, just checking on time. So a uh, quick tour through Ion Reporter. Uh, there's really, uh, this is a cloud-based solution for anal analysis, annotation, and reporting. And really there are very simple steps. You import the data up into the cloud and there is a little plug-in inside the torrent browser that you click and say import. Uh, you analyze the variation you see in your gene panel or your exome and then potentially your genome. And you can do that across one or two or three samples. So if you have family trios, you can analyze up to three samples. If you want to do tumor normal matched pairs to look for the difference, you can do that as well in Iron Reporter. Uh, you then translate that material into an adjustable report, and then you can uh, output the report and come to a conclusion, and then store that data in the cloud. So you don't need to purchase that expensive compute infrastructure. There are really uh, two parts. There's a, uh, a, a, an automated part of Iron Reporter. And that's uh, importing the reads, mapping them, the variant calling, and then the annotated variants. And you can set up a process by which you do this the same way every time. One of the important things in next generation sequencing is to make sure you're analyzing the this data in the same way each time. So Iron Reporter can actually set up a, uh, a locked workflow that you filter the data in the same way you look at the variants in the same way, and you use the same criteria to assign the value of those bases the same every time. Once you have that state, you can then, uh, uh, that data can go to a, a user who then uh, verifies that the variants that Ion Reporter or the variant caller is called are indeed correct. So you can be confident, you can drill down and look into the data, uh, make sure the annotation is relevant, and then finally, Somebody else can then come in and say, okay, I agree that all that data is correct. I sign that it's good. And you have the final report out to your clinical colleagues or your physicians. So really this tool is aimed at clinical practice. Um, it's not for, for example, non-human genomes right now. It's really targeted to human genomes. And it's really aimed at the clinical uh, side of the, the world. So, uh, in the last part of the talk, or second to last, I think we are at now, the, I'll talk about the PGM current performance and some data, what our customers have been using the PGM for out there in, in the real world. As I said, we've been increasing the output of the PGM very rapidly. Uh, this is a, a graph of the output megabases uh, in time. So we're up to about, this was about June 
And you can see the IN318 uh, was generating 1,500 megabases, uh, our best runs internally, 1.5 gigabases. The IN314 chip that started out at 10 megabases, our best runs internally now are almost 200 megabases. So there's a lot of potential. Along with the output, the accuracy of the technology, the raw read accuracy has also been increasing very quickly. And really this is a function both of the algorithms that the software team develops to process the data and do the base calling, as well as the, the molecular biology, the enzymes, the polymerases. Uh, we have new versions of the polymerases that are more accurate and allow us to get to longer reads. Uh, we also have to uh, expand the length of template that we can amplify onto the ion sphere particles. And this again is a, a time series looking at the accuracy. So if, you've, if you'd have bought one two years ago in the beginning, your uh, read length was about 100 bases and you were about 98% accurate out to that 100th base. And we've been steadily getting better and better. Our read length went up to 200 bases in the middle of last year. Uh, and uh, we're expecting our read length to go up to 300 bases in Q3 and then out to 400 bases in Q4 and keeping that accuracy flat. So our accuracies today are in the 99.5 uh, to 99.7% range nearly all the way across the read. So very accurate. A quick look at 300 base reads. So this is the coming... Uh, quarter, so by the end of this quarter we'll be up to a 300 base pair read length. This is uh, a data set that is available on Ion Community. If you want to download and look at this, you can just go to Ion Community, register with the community and download it. Uh, we're about 99.5% accurate, about to the 300th base. This is the, the distribution of read lengths. You can see the, the peak here and the mode is at almost exactly 300. And the quality of the bases, so this is the Q score, the FRED score, you can see the vast majority of the bases are over Q30 in accuracy. So the technology is accurate, it's highly useful for variant calling, and it's certainly uh, as good. So the mean raw accuracy here was 99.7. Looking forward to the end of the year, uh, we've been working on the 400 base read length. So now, uh, you can see what our 400 base reads are looking like, and we're 99.5% uh, accurate out to the 400th base in this data set. Again, if you want to look at this, you can actually download it and look at it for yourself. Modal read length at 400, and again, 65% uh, of the bases out to the 400 bases were at Q30, so a high, high proportion of the bases are extremely high quality. So this really enables pretty much all applications uh, that, that uh, any capillary sequencer can do pretty much now. At 400 base read lengths, uh, things like HLA and 16S metagenomics uh, can all be done on these kind of platforms. Um, the one question I get asked a lot is, uh, well, what about your homopolymer error rate and, and indel performance? And again, uh, this is pretty much our only error mode for this platform. We, we make literally almost no errors for single nucleotide incorporation. Uh, this is really the only error mode. So again, this has been improving rapidly. Uh, if you looked at the time between July 2011 and May, our uh, accuracy had improved about 450% for calling homopolymers up to uh, five or six mers in that time. And again, this will keep getting better and better as our algorithms get better and better and we understand the underlying uh, features of the technology and the chemistry itself. So it's, it's uh, good today and it will continue to get better as we move into the future. We this section, I'll show you some of the examples. Uh, these are all papers that are published now on Ion Torrent. We have a number of published uh, uh, papers using the Ion technology. Uh, this was the very first one. Uh, the, little, the cute guy that you see there is actually a Tasmanian devil. And uh, that was a sequence. Uh, they were using sequencing SNPs 
uh, to validate uh, a, a particularly aggressive cancer, an infectious cancer in these uh, poor uh, animals that live in Tasmania. And uh, uh, a great little paper. Uh, there was our Nature paper, so we uh, had the honor to actually get a publication in Nature on the technology itself. If you wanted to look at uh, the underlying principles of the technology, how it works, how the technology scales, you can go to that Nature paper authored by Jonathan Rothberg, our founder. Uh, and uh, middle of July 2011, we had a, a great uh, paper from the team, uh, actually two papers, from uh, a German and a UK team characterizing the German E. coli outbreak. So there was an outbreak of uh, a new strain of E. coli that was uh, uh, particularly nasty. About 30% uh, of the patients who got infected uh, ended up with uh, liver problems, and a number of them died, uh, a lot of hospitalizations. And the team in Germany, Dirk Harmsen and uh, his colleagues in Münster, uh, actually identified the genome and realized it was a new strain in about two days from having the actual samples in hand to sequence them. So they sequenced the whole microbe of this new strain, the 0104 h 4 uh, uh, and verified and identified the differences. And we were then able to take that sequence and design TACMAN assays uh, that helped the German authorities then uh, identify which food sources in Germany were responsible for the outbreak. So uh, really, this is the start of a new, uh, uh, a new, a new uh, type of work called uh, ep uh, microbial epidemiology. You can think about now surveying hospitals to look for nosocomial infections to see where the source of these bacteria and what strains are coming from. Uh, there's a whole uh, uh, new uh, area of research opening up as a result of this. This was the second paper. Uh, from a group in the UK. They did the same thing. Two independent groups, uh, both used the INPGM to do the sequencing, and within a few days of each other had both uh, deposited the sequence and then published the papers. It was really pretty incredible. Uh, we had another group in Australia who then sequenced uh, multi-drug resistant Staph aureus. And what they wanted to do was look for, uh, uh, they did the whole genome sequence on Staphylococcus aureus to look for vancomycin resistance. So they wanted to know what strains and what mutations were arising in the population and how those resistance mutations changed across the patient's treatment with vancomycin. And they did that by sequencing that whole organism genome again on the PGM. So that's a, another great paper. We had a, a group in uh, Southern California who uh, uh, then used PGM to detect a variance in uh, cystic fibrosis, so one of the most common inherited diseases in Caucasian populations. And they assessed the, the 23 standard mutations that are involved in cystic fibrosis and published a paper uh, on uh, that kind of testing. So they were very happy with the results. Uh, another microbial paper, uh, Neisseria meningitis. Uh, this was a... Uh, a uh, again, another group in Germany uh, sequencing uh, this genome. And uh, the last comment the, author, the authors made in the paper, taken together our, our first experience with the use of ion torrent PGM was very positive with respect to speed, accuracy, and the lack of necessity of further data editing. editing. So that shows you that the quality is good enough for uh, publication in these uh, reputable journals. This is actually our first paper from Latin America. Um, so uh, a group in Brazil uh, published an organism. Uh, this is a marine vibrio organism. And they published the genome. It's about a seven megabase genome. Uh, and they sequenced this organism and published in the Journal of Bacteriology. So our, our first Latin America paper. I think one of the, the publications we're, we're most excited about is, uh, is this one from uh, a group in the US. And they used our ion amplicite cancer panel, so this is our 46 gene panel looking at 700 mutations, uh, to look at a young child who would presented with a, uh, a glioblastoma. And they actually operated on the child, removed the, the tumor, and then the tumor regrew, and they sequenced it again. Uh, and they used the ion amplicite cancer panel 
and they only required 10 nanograms of material from that uh, biopsy uh, to actually get the sequence of uh, and find, identify mutations uh, in that patient sample. And they could actually see uh, uh, reads in a mutation in the MET gene down to about 5.5%. And they also saw another sample uh, that had three reads indicating about a 0.25% prevalence. Um, it's debatable whether that is real or not. Three reads we would regard as being really in the realm of noise, but they uh, did publish that in the paper. Uh, more recently, we had a group who did 5-hydroxymethylcytosine um, validation. So this is sequencing uh, methylation status, hydroxymethylated uh, CPG islands, and they verified the presence, aberrance, absence of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine uh, at uh, 57 of 59 individual cytosine positions in these CPG islands. So this is methylseq, uh, or methylation epigenomic work on the PGM. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had our first RNA sequencing paper. This is uh, a microRNA, RNA-seq experiment on knockout mice. And uh, they used our total RNA-seq kit uh, to investigate. They looked at uh, between uh, found or identified a couple of hundred mature microRNA-seq species and uh, uh, looked at all uh, the population of those microRNAs uh, in a, a sequencing reaction. I think the last uh, example I'll talk about before we move quickly on to AmpliSeq is uh, a genotyping by sequencing example. So this was a collaboration we did with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Kansas State University. I know uh, agriculture is very important in both Argentina, Uruguay, and around Latin America, Brazil. And genotyping by sequencing is a, a really nice tool to allow you to do um, uh, plant breeding or animal breeding for that matter for genomes that aren't well characterized or are very large. So if you take, for example, the barley genome, that's a five gig diploid genome, or the wheat genome, that's a 16 gigabase, and the human genome is obviously only three, uh, hexaploid genome. So these are very complex, they're not well annotated, and uh, uh, sequencing that whole genome to look for these phenotypic traits uh, is not very uh, easy. So genotyping by sequencing provides an approach to reduce the complexity of those genomes and sequence for the genotypes. And basically what they did here, you can see on the left-hand side, is to um, restriction digest with a couple of restriction enzymes into small fragments. Uh, then they ligate those together and uh, create a, uh, a molecule with adapters on it that they can sequence and then look for the traits, look for the SNPs. So it really, uh, this example on barley, uh, we targeted the genomic sequence flanking these restriction enzyme sites. Uh, it's a very simple process, um, requires much less DNA than normal, uh, completed in a couple of steps. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, the approaches are detailed in a, in a couple of papers that are well known if you're, into, if, you, if you're aware of genotyping by sequencing. And basically the only difference that we took to, from these two papers was to go from a one enzyme system to a two enzyme restriction digest system. Uh, in the experiment, they used four barley samples, two parental and two F1 hybrids. Uh, they uh, uh, isolated the DNA. Uh, they used a multiplexed sequencing approach, so each SNP that they were looking at had a particular barcode associated with it. They can multiplex many of them together, uh, use 200 base sequencing. And we were calling about 5,000 SNPs per sample uh, uh, using an IN316 chip and very good agreement to their existing uh, 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 Illumina technology that had loose performance previously. Okay, so the last part of my talk, I'll do a little bit and cover the iron ampliseq technology for ready to use and custom panels. So the ion amplitude te technology, as I said, is really a, a breakthrough technology for targeted resequencing. It makes targeted resequencing as simple as a PCR reaction. We can take up to 3,000 primer pairs per tube today. Uh, and from just 10 nanograms of starting DNA, uh, go amplify those targets and sequence them and go from DNA to annotated variants in about 10 hours. 
So the really breakthrough things about this technology are obviously the level of multiplexing we can achieve. And this is just the start. We can go much higher than 3,000 plex. And the amount of material that you have to use to start with. So if you're working with tumor biopsies or heterogeneous tumor samples, you typically might not get very much material. And 10 nanograms can be in, uh, a really enabling technology to start with those small samples. The workflow for AmpliSeq looks like this. Um, the, uh, the actual, uh, if you're doing a custom panel, you're designing your own, that process takes about two and a half hours to design the panel. Once you have your panel, or you take an off-the-shelf panel from us, that library, that process is about three and a half hours for the AmpliSeq reaction. And then from then on, it's the standard ion torrent sequencing process, about uh, four hours for the template, a couple of hours for sequence, and about half an hour to analyze the data. So how does it work? Uh, we take the isolated DNA, and we have a uh, special master mix. Uh, and in that master mix, we put some novel bases. And uh, with the primer sequences are shown in orange on this graph. So we amplify uh, the regions of interest in a multiplex reaction. And then we run a, a digestion reaction, and we actually digest away the ends of the primers, as well as any primer dimer that is formed in the reaction. So a primer dimer is the thing that you don't want to take into sequencing, because that would, you would get garbage information. So this, uh, re this digestion reaction removes all the primer dimer. It removes the ends of the primers. This leaves a few bases on either end. And then you have each of your individual amplicons uh, PCR'd up from the genome and ready to go into the ligation step where you ligate on the adapters that drive, that allow you to put those fragments onto the beads uh, uh, with or without a barcode, and that's it. It's very simple. You run the whole thing in a standard 96-well plate. You just add reagents. There's no transfers. It takes about three and a half hours. So this is kind of the reagents that you use. Um, you start with your DNA, you add your custom or ready-to-use panel, your set of primers, and then there is a core reagent kit called the Ion Absolute Reagent Kit that contains this master mix and the digestion reagents as well as the ligation uh, construction reagents and all the barcodes, and that generates your library, and that is the, the end of your library construction process. So about three and a half hours, and all you need is a thermal cycler. You go into the AmpliSeq React from the AmpliSeq library, you go into the OneTouch, you then go into the PGM, and then you can go into the torrent browser uh, and or the Ion Reporter application. So that takes about a total of 10 hours from start to finish. So easily in a day, a long day, or a day and a half if you work overnight. We have three panels that I discussed. I'll, I'll go into each one in a little bit of detail. The first panel we launched is the Iron Ampliceet Cancer Panel. That contains uh, hot spots, the mutations. Uh, we're targeting the mutations in 46 genes. We're actually targeting about 739 mutations. And you can see from the collection of genes that we have, uh, these are really all uh, well-known uh, and associated to cancer. And in particular, they tend to be uh, genes where we know you can make conclusions about the results of the mutation status of the patient. So EGFR, KRAS, BRAF, uh, P10, KIT. These are all, if you know the mutation status, there either is a drug that's indicated or you shouldn't give uh, the patient a particular drug. It was developed in combination with uh, a group of leading research, including um, uh, uh, Joe's lab here at National Cancer Institute. Um, and uh, there are a series of metrics that we look at to assess the performance of these panels. The first metric that you uh, need to consider for these is really the coverage uniformity. So the coverage uniformity means for each amplicon or each base, what coverage level do I achieve? Ideally, you'd want everything to have the same coverage level. So everything would have at least 500x coverage to be able you to call a 5% mutation. Um, what we see on this one is that uh, about 
98% of the bases are covered within 20% of the mean. So if you're sequenced to uh, 500x depth on average, you would be, all your bases should be at least 100x uh, coverage. So the better this number is, uh, the better you are in terms of the uniformity. Secondly, the, the second metric you need to look at with gene targeting is how much of my, the bases that I targeted actually hit the target region. Obviously, this is PCR, so it should hit the target region. Uh, and we have a very high number for the on-target bases, again, 98%. Uh, in this case, sorry, 96.5%, and we target at least 95% of them uh, map on our on-target. The panel allows you to detect uh, with the coverage levels. Uh, this particular panel runs on an IN314 chip. And as long as you achieve 300,000 reads with the panel, you can detect a variant where the frequency is low as 5%. And as you saw in some of the papers, we have customers now who've generated data with 3% and, and below. Probably we think 2% or around there is uh, probably the limit uh, where you can go with this panel. If you're interested, there is a data set you can download from Ion Community with the Ion AmpliSeq Cancer Panel, uh, showing the design of the Amplicons, uh, as well as the, uh, the data from a, a sequencing reaction itself. Uh, download that from the community. The second panel I'll talk about is called the Inherited Disease Panel. And this one is a much bigger panel. We have actually 10,000 amplicons in this panel in three tubes. So it's about a 3,000 plex reaction. And we're targeting 328 genes that are known to be involved in uh, inherited disorders. So Mendelian diseases uh, uh, of a variety of different kinds. Uh, neuromuscular, heart disease, developmental delay, metabolic disorders, a variety of inherited cancer syndromes, uh, blindness, deafness. There's a whole 328 genes covers pretty much what we know today. That panel runs on a single ion 316 chip and allows you to detect these heterozygous mutations. So you have one chip uh, that will allow you to do uh, sequence the full exons of 328 genes in a single day and get to that annotation in those data. Developed again with a set of uh, uh, researchers in the US, uh, it requires 30 nanograms of DNA, so uh, three pools, and um, uh, runs extremely quickly. Uh, just one data metric I'll show you on this one. Even though this is, a, again, a very big panel, uh, we're getting uh, almost 90% of the bases covered at about 20% of the mean. So very uniform technology very high on target rates, the same as uh, the cancer panel. And again, if you want to see a data set, uh, very high accuracy, 99.5 uh, to 99% out to nearly 200 bases, you can download this from our uh, community page. The last one is our comprehensive cancer panel. And this is really um, a very large panel. Uh, allowing you to do a broad survey of the coding regions of 400 genes. So we have 409 genes. We sequenced the full exons of those, uh, those genes. Again, we got the gene list by collaborating with a number of leading research institutions, Yale, MD Anderson, uh, Baylor, uh, Johns Hopkins. And um, it runs on a ion, single ion 318 chip to give you about 350x depth coverage and requires just 40 nanograms of DNA. So with an ion 318 chip, you can really survey now uh, a massive number of genes and look for driver mutations that you didn't know the significance of. And it targets various pathways. It covers uh, cosmic mutations, uh, multiple types of uh, tumors, all kinds of uh, genes are targeted. And again, um, we have high coverage uniformity. This is, uh, uh, we expect it to be greater than 93%, 90%, and we're showing data that uh, shows we get 93% of bases covered with that 20% of the mean. So with this panel, you can really think about 
looking for mutations that you don't know the significance of. Uh, what are the driving mutations for various tumors? You can go back, look at all your banked FFPE samples, and see for a particular class of tumor what mutations are really driving those tumors. All kinds of possibilities open up. And again, there's a data set. Should you wish to look at it, you can download from the, the ION community. Uh, last part, the, the custom designer. There's a website. I know uh, not quite available in Argentina yet, but hopefully in the next month or two, this will be here. Uh, Ampleseek.com. Uh, you go to this design website. You register with us. And it's a simple web-based design tool that allows you to input sequences or regions of the genome. And we can give you an Ampleseek design back for any part of the genome. Uh, right now, we can design for up to about one megabase of sequence and uh, about 3,000 amplicons in each primer pool. So you go to the website, you enter the list of targets, your gene list or your gene region list, your bed file. We'll do the design, and that takes us typically around about two hours. <coughs> Excuse me. And you get an email back when that design is ready, and then you can review the design, and uh, within the designer, you can click a button and look at, pull up the UC Santa Cruz genome browser and look at the design we've given you back. Make sure you're covering the amplicons we give you, cover all the regions that you're really interested in. You get a series of metrics about the coverage rates, <coughs> how much we're designing for, and then you can decide to place your order or go back and, and do something different and target different parts of the genome. Once you've placed your order, um, it um, takes about two to four weeks uh, for us to get the oligos to you, and they come in uh, uh, one or two pools, depending on how you'll do the design. If you do a full exon-based design, it's most likely to come in two pools, because we have to, when we tile the amplicons, we can't have them directly overlapping, so we have to split into two pools. If you give us a hotspot design, in other words, you target discrete regions of the genome, and they're separated, well, we can give you a design in a single pool. So what you get back is, uh, depends on exactly how many primer pairs you get. Uh, just to give you a rough idea, um, if you had 192 primer pairs in your design, uh, that would cost you around about $1,300 US, maybe a little bit more in Argentina. And what you would get back is 3,000 reactions 3,000 AmpliSeq reactions that are pre-made into the pool. And you also get 6,000 reactions with each primer pair separated in a plate. So you get a total of 9,000 reactions. And the 6,000, you can actually go back and either pull uh, subsets out of the, from the plate if you wanted to go smaller or uh, potentially swap in uh, others. So we target, if you're doing uh, somatic mutation work, we target that you should get 500x coverage. And uh, uh, on the 314, that will allow you to design panels that are in the range of about a KB to about 500 kilobases in size. And if you're looking only at germline variants, we, we expect you should target about 20x coverage for each base, and therefore allows you to design bigger panels from 10 KB to up to a megabase of sequence. Lastly, a quick word on the community. Um, this is our open uh, source for all the protocols, the data sets, the source code. We even post the source code for the torrent browser on this one. If you're a software guru and you think you can do better algorithm design than our software designers, you can actually download our source code and have a go at doing that. You can make your own plugins and post them up to the community if you design a little tool. And uh, uh, it's all there. We actually have a, uh, a place called uh, the Ion Recognition. And if you, you can post uh, your runs on the PGM, uh, the, sorry, a summary of the information on a particular run on the PGM. And if it's one of the best runs of the month, the most output, uh, we give you a prize. And uh, you can get up to $5,000 if you have the best run of the month. So you can see everybody's runs on the community, who's got the best run, and you can actually uh, challenge each other. Uh, 
So there's all kinds of prizes from uh, uh, USB sticks to T-shirts to sweatshirts to uh, uh, iPods and iPads. Uh, and even uh, trips to conferences and PGMs and, and real money. <laughs> so register. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was interesting and I'm happy to answer any questions.